Hey everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Adobo and Avocados. My name is Marie and today I have... Nicole van der Hooven. I am Marie's colleague and friend. And we also have a special guest today. And I'm not going to attempt to say her name because I just realized I didn't actually ask how to pronounce it. <laughs> Would you Hi, like everyone. to pronounce it for us? Yeah, um, so my name is Lena Nyström, uh, nickname Pagan. Nice. Well, for anyone who doesn't know who Lena is, so Lena is an engineering manager. Um, I've met Lena um, numerous times as well during, like, you know, I think uh, the different conferences, so mainly Agile Testing Days and uh, Test Bash uh, UK as well. Um, but she's also the creator of the Would You Risk It uh, cards and books. I actually have one uh, here with me today. So we're going to be talking about um, this as well later on. Um, but I think mainly like it's like a different sort of, I think we're going to be covering like a diverse set of topics today. Uh, so starting on, I guess, like, how you started your career in tech and then we'll talk more about like your career in general um and yeah we'll dive right in into like your inspiration for the cards uh and the book because uh you've you've written a book based on the cards as well but first of lena like how did you started your career uh in tech was it accidental or you knew straight on that yep i'm gonna work in you know in tech um I guess both. Um, I grew up with a father who uh, loved tech stuff. Uh, I don't know if there's a saying outside of Sweden. In Sweden, we say uh, you have the thumb in the middle of your hand when you're like really not good with practical things. That was mm. my dad, but he still loved it. Mm. So I grew up with like power tools and putting wood on, on walls and renovating building saunas and things. And um, uh, computers were a thing in our home from, from an early age, but I didn't really know that you could work with it. So my mm. plan was to be a teacher or work with like, uh, I don't know, um, some sort of economics. Uh, and I hate numbers. Uh, so that, I realized that would be a, a bad call and uh, teachers in Sweden didn't really have, don't have any good like work, um, like bad salaries, bad, uh, big classes, uh, a lot of extra work outside of. So I was like, no, I don't really want to do that because I'm lazy and I'm greedy. And I'm like, what can I do that would make me money? Tech. Yeah. Uh, so, so I kind of slid into it from a, a practical point of view this is something that I can support me and there's a lot of jobs available and I uh, I didn't have the um, I didn't have the right like base education to do the proper engineering classes so I did something that's called informatics which is like more human behavior centric uh, got a job as a programmer i had no idea i'm like how why is anyone going to pay me to code um but apparently it it's it was enough and uh yeah 20 something years later i'm still here somehow nice so you so you said that you started as a programmer um what was the first programming language uh that you learned the first one I learned was actually C++. Um, mm -hmm. I never worked with it professionally. Uh, I worked with, oh God, I'm old, uh, Visual Basic. Uh, and then when I started working, it was in a, a very obscure programming language called uh, Progress 4GL, nowadays Progress Open Edge. Uh, so either you worked with it or you've never heard of it like the two opposites yeah i think i'm on the latter i don't think i've, I've heard of it have you heard of uh, it nicole no i yeah. haven't yeah i just wanted to also comment on what you said about your your dad um, that resonated with me because 
um, I, I grew up in a culture where women aren't supposed to go into technical things or anything with your hands, you know, women go into like languages and literature and, you know, things like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it was very like stereotyped. But my dad was an, an, an engineer, an electrical engineer, but he always encouraged that side of me. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's so nice when when you're when a father can actually encourage that in in his daughter i don't know about you but but for me it certainly had an effect yeah i think for us it was uh encourage is is a very kind way of putting it he expected it um he was oh. <laughs> he had two daughters and we were expected to be civil engineers that's it oh so, wow um, so he was really upset that none of us took that route uh, mm. My, my sister started uh, her career in like um, like physical graphics, like printing. Um, and then later on, she's actually uh, taken several civil engineer uh, degrees. Um, but he was really upset that I didn't do that because he, he always thought that it would hold me back. So he stopped complaining when I passed him salary-wise. <laughs> yeah. I think it's because uh, like in, in, in the Philippines, we had, well, we, um, like most parents, they have that expectation that, you know, their kids will go into like a certain industry, like typically it's, you know, doctors or being a lawyers. Um, but I think for my case, um, it's, it's a, it's a different sort of upbringing because like, I think both my parents they, they so they didn't force me to hey you need to be you know a doctor or you need to work in like certain industry because i think like from their side they know that i'm quite headstrong <laughs> so they can't really um you know like say to me hey you have to be you know doing this degree so i think career wise they've you know just um, let me um, like navigate it by myself um, and it's good at least that I have you know their support uh, but now like even now like when for example when I talk about my work you know to them they they still don't understand <laughs> what I do they yeah. just you know yeah they they're just like happy and like supportive that I am in my career and you know but it's it's good because I think like having like supportive parents um, really make you know that difference um but yeah it's it's i guess like different you know parenting styles because i guess some parents would have certain expectations of like what you you know need to be when you grow up some parents are just yeah it's okay whatever you do and whatever makes you happy well um why don't yeah. you why don't you also tell us a little bit and not just us but other people watching this later um if like what you do, what you do on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, what you've been up to these days. Yes. Uh, so my, my, my title is engineering manager and depending on which uh, company or type of company you work with, that could mean basically anything I've come to realize. Um, I think I, my role is very like, um, a typical engineering manager in the Nordics, uh, which seems to be very different from engineering managers in other uh, parts of the world where it, it's more close to what we would have as tech leads. So it's part of it is, of course, uh, recruitment and uh, dealing with people, individuals. Part of it is keeping my teams happy, even though I'm, I'm like, I have a product owner, product manager that deals with like the delivery part, but I'm still, uh, I still, since I am the manager of most people in the, in those teams, I still have like the team health perspective. Uh, and then also working with more like the engineering department wise, like how, how does our career frameworks look like? How do we work with recruitment in general? Um, do we need to do some big tech initiatives so it's it's working on three levels at the same time it's like individuals teams and the organization uh, and then uh coaching um hiring 
driving the technical agenda and um, other stuff at the same time. So it's, I don't know if I have a typ typical day except for my like three stand-ups every morning that take out half of my, half of my day before lunch. Hmm. So I'm wondering, um, was there, I think it's always very interesting with that, that switch from like being an engineer and being an ind individual contributor, taking that leap into management. What was that like for you? Was it always something that you were working towards or did you struggle with a decision? Um, uh, going back to my dad, <laughs> He was really happy once I gave up on uh, not wanting to do that uh, because I always said for like the first 15 years of my career that that was something I would never do. Uh, and he was always, he always wanted me to go that route. And I was like, no, that's not for me. Um, I mean, my first career switch was not from programmer to manager. I, I took, uh, I, I went from programmer to working with, with testing, test, lead test management parts which is halfway to management uh, and then I took the step into like more people management so once I did the switch I had already been doing the the work for a couple of years just not with the title so basically my my boss at the time said like hey you've been doing these things um I, I can't keep giving you this type of assignment, these type of, of tasks without you actually taking on the responsibility. So I did, uh, I was terrified because it meant I had to deal with people, I had to deal with conflicts, I had to deal with uh, upper management people, uh, budgets, um, and I, I thought I was gonna hate those parts, uh, but uh, like I can do it because it means I can also do the strategy work and the, and the long-term planning and all those things. And uh, strangely enough, I realized that the budgets are really cool once you start looking at them like long-term. Once, once you see, oh, the choices I made in October last year actually makes an effect now, two years later. Um, and I mean, difficult conversations are difficult but they're also very rewarding once you like solve them um and um i i, I won't say that i like conflicts because that sounds horrible but i like i think <laughs> they are necessary uh, and i think if we don't have them there's also something strange and probably wrong going on because we mm. are human we have conflicts and we have things that mm. um, go wrong or things we don't like and we are different people who interpret things mm -hmm. we, we make assumptions that are not true so I think um, I don't like them but I like the effect of working through them mm. yeah I, I, I can relate um, in like some cases because um, prior to being a developer advocate, so I was a quality uh, engineering manager and I really love the, you know, coaching part, like mentoring part, but like in terms of, you know, conflicts and having the difficult conversations, it's something that I really had to, you know, like fully work on because um, it's not always, I guess, like, a nice day if you you know say to someone that they're not performing well and then that you have to do it with empathy and like there's like different like styles as well of you know being um, a manager but it's not for everyone because you know like people management like I guess like you do need you know different skills um, so for me um, my experience is um, I tried it I you know I saw that I could make impact to you know my uh, direct report but there was a part of me that really missed the individual contributor side um, so I don't know if you felt or if you had, you know, some experience like that where you've been working now as an engineering manager, if you've missed doing the IC part or like you're just really um, enjoying um, um, like doing the, you know, 
the um the people side like the strategic side um or s- sometimes do you ever miss i guess just doing the um ic work uh yes every week um i mean it goes up and down and i i mean if someone would actually give me the choice i'm not sure i would go back and i know i would be unhappy having to like switch too much because uh, I, i don't like context switching um but i do miss it i do miss the simplicity i do miss the uh and i don't mean simplicity in like the the work is easier but it's like it you do a task and it's finished um you you the scope is more defined yes uh, and and there's like a there's like a start and a finish in a way that that management isn't really um and you can focus in 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 a way that i don't feel like i can um so yes i do miss it um i'm not sure i could give up the parts that i've gotten instead um uh, mm-hmm. but some weeks it's just like it would be so nice to do something and feel like you can check something off a checklist be, be finished with something and not have to wait two years to see the effect of that budget decision i like what you said about conflict earlier I think that there is such a thing as healthy conflict. In fact, mm-hmm. I think within a team setting, if there is absolutely no conflict, I would question whether there's something else that's wrong. Do people not feel safe enough to raise dissenting opinions? Because dissent is is a positive thing, you know, when done respectfully. And maybe the other thing could be a lack of diversity in thought. Because mm-hmm. it is impossible for a bunch of people to work together and all think the same thing and always agree on the right course of action and always do things a certain the same way. That's nearly impossible. So I I think that would almost be a warning sign for me if there was never any conflict. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I've I've seen teams that are so comfortable with each other that they it never seems that they have conflicts because they kind of try it out or or uh experiment or just uh solve it without it feeling like a conflict uh but they they still disagree on things um the most unhealthy team i've been in was actually a, a management team where it was so unsafe that we never had conflicts or disagreements uh, mm-hmm. except of what we did, but we did it in like one-on-ones uh, instead of mm-hmm. in the group. So that was a very unhealthy group, uh, but mm, some people liked it because it was always easy to get decisions in that group. We just followed whatever two people uh, yeah. suggested. Yeah. Has that um has that influenced, for example, um any of your you know core values as being a manager? So um, you know, any like are are there any bad experiences in the past that you know have shaped, I guess, the way you manage people now? I think uh many people would say the same thing. Um I've had very bad managers and that was one of the reasons I chose to go into management because um hopefully I could do it better. Um I think I trust people a lot and I care about people a lot and I tell them that I do. Um and I'm also very open with the fact that I also struggle with things and that mm. usually helps people to open up. There are of course people who hate that type. They want managers to be um uh, strong and and confident and always know what to do and those people would probably not be happy uh, being managed might be, but um I think I think I'm good at 
like shifting the way I manage to the people and the team that, that I'm working with because uh, you can't manage someone straight out of school the same way you do someone who has like 20 years of experience on top of my experience because it, it will not, they, they need different things. Um, so I think when it comes to people management one-on-one, -on -one, I, my core value is to try to teach, uh, treat people the way they need to be treated, the way they like to be treated, or, or at least the way they need to be treated, instead mm -hmm. of like, uh, forcing my way, my preferred way of management upon them. Uh, when it comes to teams, I'm probably uh, way more hands off than most people because the, the team part is not where I excel. That's not where I, my passion lies. There are other people who care way more about, about like the team structure than I do. Um, but when it comes to, to people, I think the core is just trying to change me instead of changing everyone else. Mm. I, so what I love... Building... Go on, Marie, go on, sorry. Go on. <laughs> um, I was going to make a comment because... Um, I love that, like you said, that you also sh um, show to them that sometimes you are struggling and that has led them to open up um, as well. Um, I think our manager now, uh, David, uh, Nicole, also um, showed that to us because when we had that, you know, weekly uh, meeting um, and he was open about, for example, not meeting um, his OKRs for this quarter. And I think that has had a positive ripple effect because I was also able to communicate that I was also struggling with, you know, my OKRs. And um, initially, like, my view around OKRs is I have to complete every single one of them. Um, I've been so... It's like I, I've, I've been looking at it as, like, a checklist that, hey, if I don't do this, like, I might have, you know, more work or, like, I might have, you know, be seen as someone who overcommitted. But then when he mentioned that, I, you know, you could see that I'm, I also didn't meet any of my OKRs um, and it's fine. Like, you know, we're, like, we all will have days where like we can't just you know complete everything like that has made me open up as well and say okay you know what i have you know two okrs that i know i'm not gonna complete and that's okay as because i i know that you know i've i've tried my best to see if i can complete it so i really love um what you said about creating that um openness and like transparency as well and not having i guess to show to everyone that as a manager, you always have to complete, you know, all the tasks. Yeah. I think yeah, if, you I, do, I, if you always meet everything, then you haven't like set any stretch goals at all. Yeah. That would have me more worried than not meeting everything all the time. Sorry, Nicole, I, I interrupted you. No, no, that that's okay. I mean, that's latency, right? <laughs> um <laughs> I was just going to say that a, a couple of weeks ago, our last guest, Callum, spoke about diversity. And one of the things that he mentioned is that him being openly diverse and, and expressing divergent thoughts or, or like just different thoughts, really, from his own experience, um, also improved the overall culture of the team because it encouraged others to express ideas that that dissented from the norm as well. But it's kind of hard to, to hire for that. As a manager, you are in charge of building a team as well. Um, how, do you, how do you go about that? What do you actually look for in an interview? Um, it, so it's, it's been different in all of the different companies I've been a manager in, of course. Um, and different companies are willing to go to uh willing to go further to add diversity uh, even though every company says that they want diversity different companies actually put in the work more uh, or or less um and also so the company i'm at now uh we typically hire like for the company we don't hire for a 
particular team. Uh, even though at like the latest stages of the, the process, we try to puzzle into a certain team and like do a team fit. But, but when we look at candidates, when we look at applications and who we reach, reach out to, it's more on like, would this person fit into the organization overall? Um, and I would say maybe diversity isn't the factor that we've been focusing the most on because we've been hiring a lot for the last years. Uh, this year we have kind of slowed down uh, as most companies have. So, so this year we, we could focus more because if you're going to hire 30 people in a year, you, you can't have diversity on top of your mind for all those, those people. Um, but I mean, one thing that, Swedish companies are becoming better at is the they're scratching the the Swedish requirement in the in the uh, when hiring uh, there are still companies who who do require Swedish but uh, then they also get a less diverse pool of candidates of course um, Mentimeter where I came from before uh, my current company uh, they had a more um, direct approach so so they actually hired from all over the world and then relocated people to Sweden um, which makes it uh, a lot easier to add diversity if you look at diversity as uh, more than just gender um, but I mean for me in particular I'm looking for when I hire for my teams I am looking to have a team with a mix in as many perspectives as possible. So, so like gender, background, age, uh, type of education, uh, what do you care about? Uh, are you uh, someone who loves to deliver things to customers? Are you someone who loves to clean up tech debt? I want to mix up all of those because um, that to me is like a healthy ecosystem of a team. Uh, all of my colleagues don't feel the same way. They like people who are of a, of a certain type and they hire that type. So uh, it's, it's hard and I try, I try to put as much of my personal values into the hiring without like pushing it to the companies because I, I'm still hiring for a company. I'm not hiring for my company. So that was a very long-winded, uh, it depends on her, <laughs> I think. One um, thing that I really liked is um, I think sometimes there's a lot of focus on just diversity. But like you said, diversity is kind of ambiguous, diversity in what sense? And one of the things I liked about, I li still like about our current team is our manager is very big on culture add instead of diversity. And that kind of changes it a bit because it's not about race or gender or whatever, sexual orientation or, or whatever. It's everything. It's mm -hmm. anything that a, a potential candidate has that isn't currently represented on the team. It could be a strong educational background or, or even an artistic side or something like that. Just a, a diversity in the sense of all experiences and you know, the way, the kind of biases that we all have, just mm -hmm. making sure that those are different and that they add to the team something that isn't already there. Yeah. Yeah. It's related to, um, I remember, I just remembered Callum's episode again on, you know, the whole danger of having a monoculture, um, just even in quality, because imagine if you're just hiring from, I guess, people who share the same perspective, there's going to be um, different kinds of issues that they're going to miss. Um, whereas if you have a team with, you know, diverse mindset, diverse, you know, backgrounds, then um, the chances of finding, you know, different um, issues um, will, you know, will be much higher because then you'll have those different perspectives um, as well. Um, I'm, I'm wondering though, because... Um, you you said um, at, at the beginning that you started as a programmer and then tester and then now you're an engineering manager. Were there any like skills or like um, like 
I guess, like skills that you've transferred um, when you were working as a tester, have you transferred any of those now that you're an engineering manager? Uh, definitely. Uh, I think I have an entire blog post about that somewhere. Um, so, so a disclaimer first. Uh, I was I was thinking about this in my car because I was driving driving uh, home from from my boyfriend this morning, and I was like. So did I actually do testing? And I realized that most of my roles when I switched to testing were in like a test lead or test manager uh, type of position. So, I mean, of course, testing was part of that, but I don't think I was ever just a tester. I, there was always that planning and strategy part because that was that was the part that got me excited when I, when I found testing. Uh, the how can I make this better perspective? How can I make sure we improve over time? Um, and uh, as I said in the beginning, you're halfway into management once you do that because mm -hmm. planning, uh, keeping, uh, testing um, perspective in, in a team over time, looking at improvement over time, looking at like how can, uh, what is wrong in our pipeline? Uh, what do we need to automate? Uh, who are our stakeholders? How do we how do we improve in all of the different aspects? That all of those things are very valuable once you move into management. Uh, and testing is often um, uh, like the the diplomat in the team uh, trying to calmly and politely bring up issues without making people feel upset uh, and a, a lot of those things once you become good at that you're halfway into coaching uh, so mm -hmm. it's like a lot of a lot of the things that made me a good test lead or test manager manager also made me a good strategist and uh, people manager and having that programming background as a base also makes it a lot easier to like understand when people are um how are we with swearing in this podcast when they are <laughs> just when they are just trying to get there that's okay uh, a lot of developers also don't have the respect for testing as they should or testers and they uh, I've met a lot of testers that are kind of afraid of challenging developers uh, ideas because they're like I don't know I'm not I'm not a coder uh, so that's also helped me um, being able to say hmm, that's very interesting how do you I understand why we would want to add logging to this feature but how do you mean that actually solves this uh, like uh, security issue that we're working on, which is the actual reason that we are allowed to do this hotfix? And they're like, mm, no, it doesn't. Then yeah, let's do that in a regular release and focus on finding a uh, solution to this instead. So I think the combination has been really, really, really good. I think it in in a way it is a natural progression. I think that there are different levels of testing. You know, someone who has just started, who is new to testing, is going to test according to the specifications. And then later on, you start to question the specifications themselves. Like, is that a reasonable assumption? Does this describe all of the uh, users that we're trying to cater for? And then beyond that, you start to, th to get into systems thinking. And maybe mm -hmm. there are other parts of the system that you need to test. And it just, you kind of start to zoom out. And not just as a manager, but also as an individual contrib contributor or a leader that is not in a management role. So I think there's there's definitely a lot of overlap there. And I think, you know, testers tend to be a curious bunch and those who follow that curiosity to that higher level of Zoom um, certainly find themselves in very similar positions, I think. Yeah, I, I think as well, because because um, you've you've had that background in both um, programming and, you know, testing um, that. To me also has um those advantages where 
I guess it's easy for you to, well, it's much easier for you to communicate the value um, to the rest of the team because, like, you can relate it back to, I guess, um, terms or, like, words or, like, how do I say this? Not terms, but, like, um, like their, like, lingo. Like, you can communicate with their, you know, um, with their, um, like, choice of, I guess, like, language because, like, for example, like with the developer advocacy role, um, and this is like from what I've, um, from what I've, uh, from what I've understood, I've only been doing dev advocacy for, oh gosh, almost a year next month. <laughs> um, but I guess like the developer advocacy role came into fruition because um, developers would be more comfortable speaking to people who have like the same sort of background rather than people who are i guess just purely marketers and then like obviously they did they 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 weren't using a specific tool or a specific i guess like um like product whereas if they're speaking to someone who's actually you know been at their job uh doing you know things that they were doing then they're much more comfortable speaking to that person so i think like and cor- correct me if i'm wrong but i think you having that career sort of like background in programming and in tech and in testing as well um and you can bring those skills across um to you know being an engineering manager i think that um can also you know help in influencing uh the rest of your team i think um i mean i mean yes but i think mostly it it uh, helps with my confidence uh because yeah. if i if i there's a lot of developers who uh, don't see me as as uh, technical because it's it's I mean it's so far back that I actually like coded for money, um, and in in uh, so so the language I worked in is also a procedural language and not an object oriented language, which means that compared to what uh, my teams work with today, we are very far apart. Um, but it does help my confidence that I know uh, one. Uh, I understand the like the basics of software. I, the the architectural choices are still there. Are still the same balance between different um, extreme points. We so just still have to choose between: uh, Do I optimize for 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 latency? Do I optimize for throughput? Do I optimize for uh, scalability, do I optimize for uh, data correctness? All of those things are still the same. Um, and I can see that gives me a confidence that some of the colleagues I've had uh, in the past don't have. And um, it, it actually makes me kind of sad because I can see that they don't trust their um, technical skills uh, they see themselves as non-technical and I'm like but you're doing so much technical work every day um, so I think the biggest part is the confidence in myself um, but I might be wrong maybe maybe it helps their confidence in me as well it's just I feel like it would be so much harder to do the job I do if I didn't mm-hmm. trust my own instincts and my own like gut feeling when it comes to technical choices that I mean I've never I think the only job I've ever written is uh, in a tutorial with um, uh, a test automation tutorial or a class um, but we are still making the same choices it's just a different syntax and yeah. Even though uh, the systems I programmed were very far from cloud-based, I still it, it's still the same uh, Lego blocks. In in like you make different choices, but they are still based on the same uh, foundation. They're still the same yeah. foundational choices you make. 
I think it's so it's so funny how we delineate between technical and non-technical because what what most people think of as technical is like the the language as part of it the the nitty gritty of it. However, the level above that is seeing the pattern, abstracting from the specific, and thinking thinking of how things are similar, like what you're saying. I mean, a lot of what happens in tech, all of these new trends. They already occurred in a, in some sort of similar way before, so it's funny that that lower level, which is very entry level, really, we see as technical. But once you get past that and have the, have the experience to see through to the patterns, somehow that's not technical, but it's got to be. It is an extension of that. Someone who isn't technically oriented at all won't be able to get to that point where they see the patterns or the mental、mm -hmm. models. You know, so I think the I think a lot of times the word technical is used as a, an opportunity to gatekeep. Yeah, yeah,、uh, that's one of my biggest pet peeves when people say、uh, candidate X is not technical enough, and I'm and I'm like, so when you say technical, <laughs> do you mean coding skills? And they're like, yes,、yeah. technical. I'm like, no, technical could be databases or infrastructure、yeah. or, or or models or or data, how data flows. It could be a ton of things. Um, so if you mean coding skills, say coding skills.、Um, yeah, it's the same with testing, isn't it? Like there's,、um, I mean, I've seen you know like a few posts from people like, hey, if you're not coding or if you're not writing you know automated tests, you're not technical. But that isn't the only way to show you know your technical skills, like using different like debugger tools or you know. Monitoring the like performance of your application or interpreting the different results; those are all highly、um, technical skills. But there just seems to be so much focus on you need to write automated tests so that you can be considered a technical tester. But we need to just stop that misconception because there are you know different ways、uh, to show your skills、um, to、uh, to show your technical skills as a、um, as a tester. So you also strike me as a manager that's very empathetic. You talk a lot about you know getting to know the person and and trying to meet them where they are, basically. But I think that that is that brings into question this idea that you know oh it's not personal, it's business. But when you genuinely care about someone, it's all personal. And that does take an emotional toll as well, I imagine, on you, because you have to constantly toe that line between having, you know, maintaining some of that distance, enough distance to be able to have difficult conversations if necessary, but also seeking that, seeking some level of closeness because you want to understand people and what their strengths are, and sometimes that can lead to a lot of burnout. I mean, do you have clear delineations between, you know, what is work and what is personal?、Um, I think I've gotten better at it, but I don't think there will ever be like a, a clear black and white.、Um, it's funny you should say、uh, that everything is personal, like because、uh, I was gonna spontaneously say the opposite.、Uh, being personal is、oh. good business. Um, one of the things that I often talk to people about is、uh, like staying home when you're sick.、Uh, don't work when you're sick.、Uh, if you're sick,、mm -hmm. you're sick.、Uh, I understand it could,、um, if it's possible with your finances, stay sick.、Uh, like, like stay in bed. Don't work. Don't answer Slack. Don't do anything because the fact is, the more you rest, the less it's going to cost me in the end. So、mm. if you keep trying to work, you're going to end up with more sick days. So、uh, having a team that works, having a team where people are happy, having a team、uh, that is safe, speak their mind,、um, take their sick leave, tell them, tell me, or tell them each other when something is is、um, is hard. That's going to cost me less money in the end.、Um, And of course, that's、uh, of course I also care about them, but it's also good business. So it's like caring about them is both because that's who I am as a person, but it's also what I know for a fact、uh, is the cheapest option. 
Mm. And I, I wish more managers understood that and, and pushed for that instead of pushing for short term gains when it's just going to cost them in the long run. Yeah, I think, yeah, the whole approach to sickness, because there are, I think it's much easier as well, like now that people are working remotely, um, that, you know, they don't have to come to the office, they can just, you know, continue working. But, you know, that's also not as good, because like you said, that can extend um, the sickness over time. Um, I do have, um, and it might i think this is a personal personal question so feel free to like if you're not comfortable um answering it but um we've talked about like your career journey and like from an outsider perspective like it seems that you've had a really successful career like navigating like different career paths um enjoying something that you really love you've been really active in the testing community as well in the tech community um but i wonder um, has any of that, like, I guess, impacted anything, you know, negatively in your life or like you've worked out the balance or, you know, is, is work, you know, like balance really a thing or is it just, a, you know, a myth? Um, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, has being successful in your career impacted anything um, in your life? And you don't have to answer if it's not. <laughs> The funny thing is that I don't feel like I've had a successful career. I'm, I've am i been really struggling with the fact that I haven't gotten further. Um, mm. I want a lot more. Uh, I've been... Um, I don't know if there's a good word in English that means jealousy without like the, the bad parts. Like I... I I am extremely happy for you for giving all, getting all of these things. I think you really deserve it. I want it too. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I have a lot of friends in the community who have these amazing roles, amazing careers, and they uh, get to do the things that I know I would be amazing at. Um, and I feel like I'm stuck at like first, first line manager roles is where I, that's where I get. I'm, I'm not technical enough to get to the senior technical positions, or I'm in, in their minds, I'm not technical enough. Um, and I haven't had the manage managers uh, work enough to get like the second line manager roles. So so I, I feel stuck. Uh, so it's it's nice that other people see, see me as uh, having a successful, successful career. Um, uh, but I've never thought about the fact that it did this affect other things? Um, I don't know if you saw my keynote last year when I uh, talked at Adele Testing Days about uh, living with yeah. fear, living with yeah. uh, anxiety. Um, and I also talked a lot about my uh, divorce in that. And yeah. one of the reasons my husband decided to leave was that he felt that I didn't need him. Uh, and that hit really hard when he said that because when he said it i was like of of course it's going to be horrible to live with me if that's your drive because one of my biggest uh, drives is being independent one of my biggest drives is not needing people um i choose to be with someone and i want someone to choose to be with me i don't want them to be with me because they need me because i don't want that i don't i want us to be uh independent people uh but i also know that he struggled a lot with me traveling me doing a lot of things like this uh spending time on writing my book uh promoting the cards um i don't think i don't think we would have been happily married just if i didn't have that but i do think that it affected his view of uh like power balance perhaps mm. i think that's yeah. always a, a difficult balance to strike because especially in in a relationship there's one part where you seek to be united on the other you also seek to be separate because you can't connect if you're the same thing you know so i can see that there would be tension there and i really resonate with what you're saying about like having to travel and 
And it sounds like one of your core values is freedom and independence. Um, and that that can make it difficult, I think. How do you how do you see that? You know, something something that isn't a bad thing by any means, um, but has caused some conflict in the past. How do you integrate that into yourself and bring that with you to work? Um, I mean, my learning from that was that if if. I don't think the problem was that I spent time like outside of the us. I think the problem is that we didn't talk about it. So if he had in like the 12 years we were together, if he had told me that he struggled with this, I would have uh, toned down. I would have done less. Um, but it's also, um, it's kind of like the Instagram effect that we see all of these successful people and we feel like yeah. our, our, our life is not uh, glor glorious enough. And being a speaker is, is kind of the same thing because you compare yourself with other speakers and you're like, why haven't I gotten further? Why do I only have, uh, why haven't I done a keynote? Why haven't I done 10 keynotes? Why am I only uh, invited into the same uh, X conferences? Why, why are these conferences not seeing how amazing I am? Um, so I've struggled a lot with that. And I have a, I have a friend who is also a speaker and who I've also been like this, uh, I'm happy you get all these chances. I also want them. I want them so bad. Uh, and then at some point uh, she asked, actually uh, told me that she had been uh, speaking to her therapist about how bad she felt that she was so jealous of my success. And I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> um, so I think there are so many things that we go around feeling and we feel like we are not supposed or allowed to feel those so we don't talk about them but imagine if we actually just spoke them to people and and told them and I that I tried to do I tried to tell people that I'm really jealous of the opportunities you have you will be amazing at them. Congratulations. God, I want I want them to. And I really wish yeah. they would me instead. Uh, because while that, it doesn't mean that I don't want them to have it. And I don't think it should be, it shouldn't be seen as something bad to, to want things for yourself. Yeah. 100% agree with that. I think if anything, that, you know, shows, um, like, strong, you know, um, that, that you do know what you want. And, you know, it's not bad to, you know, say that, oh, I wish, I, or, 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 like, to say to someone, you know, I want that too. Because I think, like, in life, um, the more you are, I guess, focused on, like, what you want, then um, that can also... Um, What's that word? Um, like that can also like happen. Um, I've I've i forgotten um the um exact word, but it's like if you say, um, you know something like again and again, like if you envision it, manifesting. Um, that, that, yes, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's the word. Yeah. If you manifest it, then it can it can happen in a you know in a uh, in a near future. Um, and it shows as well like that vulner that vulnerability side. Um, and I think that is a very strong, you know, trait because, um, again, we're showing to everyone that, you know, hey, it's not all, you know, like all the happy stuff. Like we are also struggling. Um, and even with like, you know, the speaking, because um, for like, like, for example, um, when I uh, speak to my friends that, hey, I'm going to travel um, in this, you know, different country to do you know a talk they only see the you know traveling side that it's like a luxury that hey you're gonna be at the beach like are you actually working but then they don't see like what's going on behind that that all the work that you know you have to do all the you know days or nights that you have to practice that you have to like stay up late just to make sure that you've perfected you know your talk or keynote so you do miss out on like certain things just so that you could you know practice on um doing you know the things that uh, you have to do so that's the part that they don't see but yeah it's 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 great to uh be to sh to share that vulnerability uh to others 
Maybe we should talk about the cards as well, because you, you mentioned it, but we yeah. haven't directly talked about them. What are these cards? What are these cards? Um, so in, in 2019, I think uh, I was doing um, a workshop with Lisa Crispin, which is like, oh, it's, it's still a fangirl moment. She <laughs> Lisa and, and Elizabeth Hendrickson are the people who shaped me as a tester. Uh, so doing, doing a workshop with her was a big fangirl moment. Um, and we wanted to do something with risk because risk is something I, I have focused a lot on. We wanted to do something with uh, heuristics because we both felt like we don't really know what heuristics are. Everyone talks about them. Uh, we have no clue what they are. Let's do something with that. Um, and I had uh, recently found the test fear cards and I thought that was really cool. And I was like, I want to do a game. Um, so we... I decided to do uh, kind of like, I don't know what they're called. It's like the card games that I had when I, grew, when I grew up, when you had like a character with different characteristics, like uh, role playing, but with cards, uh, like Pokemon cards. Mm. Um, and I uh, found um, uh, Trish Ku, who's uh, um, uh, in, in uh, one of my Slack groups, but she's also very amazing at uh, illustration. So I asked her if she wanted to uh, illustrate them for me. And then uh, with my uh, community and uh, colleagues, I designed 30 cards that are divided into three categories. So it's traps, which is uh, common things I see testers tend to fall into, like making assumptions would be an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, tools that are more like traditional testing techniques, testing heuristics, uh, like uh, the Goldilocks heuristic, for, for example, or um, let's let's stay with that one. And then uh, weapons, which I think is is uh, more uh, different to different to other testing tools and testing uh, books and everything, because they are more um, grounded in my programming background. So things that are typically hard to do with code. So mm -hmm. like multi-threading or, or concurrency or um, um, synchronous or asynchronous communication or security or whatever. Um, and they are designed in a way to be pretty vague and open. So they mean something to me, but they could mean something different to you. And it's been really cool to... to um, see different people interact with them because they do see very different things in different cards. Some, and also they feel like it's very obvious that it means something. And I'm like, that's very interesting because the group just before you picked it as this other thing. Um, so we, we created them for this workshop, which was um, uh, like a, um, risk management risk assessment workshop we went through a project and they had to like draw a likelihood and risk uh, diagram um, or effect and likelihood and then they used the cards to add different constraints to that like what would happen if you would uh, have to think about security in this project would something else come up uh, have you thought about accessibility um, and then from there, I, I talked to, um, uh, I was thinking about how to produce them because, I mean, I, it, there are sites where you can print your own card decks, but they are like, how do I get them out to the public? So I mm -hmm. collaborate with Ministry of Testing. So they are sold through the Ministry of Testing um, merchandise shop. Uh, and then in the end, they also turned out to be a book. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's really great to hear because you've collaborated a lot with, you know, different people. Um, 
I I I haven't uh, read the book, but like, what is the main difference? I guess like, if someone would buy the book versus the cards, uh, are is there something in the book that's not on the cards, or like vice versa, or is it like an an, an extension to it? Um, I mean the the, the cards are just uh, a, a picture, a title, a category, and a rhyme, uh, and you use it in any way you want. The book has the same 30 chapters, but expanded. So for each card, there's like a, a theory part. This is how I see it. This is what I see that this card means. Uh, and then there's a story part from, from some of the team or projects that I've been working with. Uh, so uh, for like, um, uh, for the assumptions card, there's stories about uh, projects where we miss we assume things that weren't correct, for example. Or um, yeah, so I the, the someone described it as a coffee table testing book, which I thought was really nice. Uh, I hope they made it in a nice way. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think the book is a. It's a good way to start out as a tester because it has a lot of experience built into it. Uh, yeah. in, told in a, in a simple language because I, I wanted this to be like my language. There's very little technical terms and if there are technical terms, they are explained. Uh, I tried to uh, explain things uh, like different choices of synchronous and asynchronous communication, uh, I talk about as like um, uh, checkout counters in a in a store, for example. Like trying to explain it to someone who doesn't have that background. But I also yeah. think it's it's good if you have been working for for many years and you want to hear other stories. Like um, a lot of my. Uh, product owners have actually read it and the funny thing is they all see oh that's my team and I'm like oh. <laughs> yes and no <laughs> yeah that's awesome um I just realized we're um oh well, we are <laughs> time but I do want to ask one question because um one of the like first like striking things that i notice about you is you love colors and you know it's like in your color uh, you can't see but it's in like your colorful logo uh what's the story behind it is there any like personal um story that yeah you would like to share about yeah the story behind your um colorful logo um so at the time this was drawn i had blue hair so so the girl is me uh and i love foxes uh, and I have a very big uh, fox tattoo on my leg. So my tattoo artist actually drew this. And I gave her free hands. Oh, nice. and I was like, you know what I like? Uh, yes. Make me something. And and uh, this was one of the options she sent me. That's really nice. Yeah. And, yeah. They are all very colorful. Everything she's done. Yeah. <laughs> Nicole would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love colorful tattoos as well. <laughs> So we have a question that we we ask every guest. The name of of the show is Adobo and Avocados because well we're developer advocates that's the avocado part but the adobo part it, it's actually a Philippine dish so Marie and I are both from the Philippines and adobo is like a a national dish but more than that I think it's also like a comfort food because you can make adobo with pretty much any leftover and so it tends to be something that at least I associate with with home is there something that is kind of like your adobo whether that's a food or something that you do something that makes you feel at home um so food wise there's definitely this um uh so my mom, uh, may, she had a very particular taste in food. So I didn't grow up with uh, onion, tomato-based food like most of the sweets do. They have tomato in everything. They have onion in everything. Uh, I grew up with like um, uh, soy-based cream sauce. 
and she made this uh, minced meat sauce that's like spaghetti bolognese but without the tomato and the onions but with that cream sauce instead so that's always uh, like if I want to make something uh, that's quick to make I know it's always going to taste great and it's going to like uh, ground me. That's the, that's the dish I'm going to make. And and everyone in Sweden always feels it's very strange when I make it because <laughs> it's not how they do it. Uh, but other than that, it's just uh, crashing on my couch playing video games. That's, that's home. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, you know, for being with us today, um, for sharing your you know, journey in terms of your career for being so transparent, um, showing your vulnerability side as well. Um, and thank you for, yeah, for letting um, the people know as well about your books and cards. We'll, um, we'll make sure to add uh, the description as to how people can, you know, buy these cards uh, and books. Because I think, yeah, if someone is starting out as a software tester, I think having these different, you know, resources um, are really useful. Um, but yes, I think we're back again next week. Um, I won't announce um, the speaker's name, but it's going to be a surprise. Um, so yeah, I hope that everyone learned something new today um, from Lena and from ourselves. And yeah, I hope that everyone will have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, Lena. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. <laughs> <laughs> we really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.